शकुंतलाकाया चक्षुर्मिलना तस्म श्रीगुरव नम नम ओं विष्णुपाधा कृष्णपृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्तिदेदात स्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सरस्वती देव गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चातिदेशिणे वाचाकलुतरूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गाधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे माय डियर लॉर्ड कृष्णा प्लीज गाइड अस सो दैट वी कैन understand your, the depth of your wisdom and most importantly the depth of the love of your infinite heart which is revealed to us in the concluding chapter of your immortal song Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So today we complete uh, can come to the conclusion of the journey of the Gita, and uh, here toward the seventeenth chapter and its ending, Krishna has described how one can understand the level of a person's faith by looking at the actions that they do. what kind of food they take in and then what kind of yagya dana tapa they do and then he says that how the om tat sat the ultimate has to be invoked if any activity has to have any enduring meaning now at this point arjuna asks a question at one level this question seems to be similar to what he has asked earlier but he phrases it differently earlier arjuna i mean in one sense the same question has been asked in the starting question itself so 2.7 was what is dharma 3.1 is what is the which is better action or renunciation 5.1 is also similar now we have 18.1 so that this question is basically about the difference between renunciation that is sanyas and detachment so he is using the word renunciation generally speaking in the sense of the renounced order so basically he wants to clearly understand what is the difference between uh, external and internal so to all those in the we had at the start itself we had discussed this theme of how engaged does not mean attached and disengaged does not mean detached so if we could consider these two people people in the renounced order now if we consider the gita's context of renunciation is just giving up word work and going to the forest that is not the renunciation that in bhakti we practice so and then there is detachment so he wants to know what is the relationship between these two are these two completely identical are these two completely separate that's his essential question so 
the question of course is related with his battlefield context where should I fight or should I not fight? If fight, uh, fighting is not just a physical activity. Generally, we come to the level of fighting only when we are very strongly emotionally invested in something. That means that it's very difficult to actually be detached while fighting. Fighting is a matter of life or death. And it is either, rather we, either we lose our life or we have to take somebody else's life. Or at least if it doesn't go till fatal, at least the fighting is not going to stop unless one person is severely beaten up and injured or the other person is severely beaten up and injured. So fighting has this external aggression to it. But at the very least it has internal strong emotion without that fighting is very difficult so what would detachment mean for fighting now of course somebody may, may, may be able to fight fight for money it's just their job they don't really hate the other person <clears throat> then also they must have a fairly strong attachment for money that there are so many jobs that one, one might take to get some money. So even then, this strong emotion, some strong emotion has to be there for a person to seek money. So let's look at the words that Krishna starts with. Sanyasasya Mahabaho. Oh, now it's interesting throughout the Gita, generally it is Krishna who is referred to Arjuna as Mahabaho. So here Krishna, Arjuna is returning the favor, returning the compliment here. You are also mighty arm. So he is saying that, he, uh, here is a mighty arm in the sense that you are powerful enough to dissipate my illusions. So Mahabaho is a generic uh, glorifier, epithet for describing warriors. So he says, Tattvam Ichami Veditum. Tattvam. The word Tattva has been used repeatedly in the Bhagavad Gita for referring to the essence, truth. Those who know me in truth. Janma Karma Chame Devim Evam Yoveti Tattvataha. So Tattvam, the truth of it. Tattvam Ichami Veditum. I desire to know it. So, Sanya Sasya Mahabaho. Sanya Sasya Mahabaho. Tattvam Ichami Veditum. Then he says, not only this tattva I want to understand, Tyagasya cha Rishikesha. Tyaga is whatever it is. It is something similar to sannyas, but something different also. So the way he is using is sannyasa is external renunciation, the renounced order. Tyaga is detachment. Now he is not specifying this is what he means, but he is using these two words. Tyagasya cha Rishikesha. Rishikesha. At the start of the Gita, Arjuna's senses were going wild. He was not able to hold on to the bow. So he said, you, O Lord, can bring my senses under my control. Styagasya Rishikesha. Prutak. Prutak. Now, key point is, I don't just want to understand these two, two truths. What I want to understand is the difference between the two of them. Prutak. Keshinishu. So, this is the only verse in the Gita where three epithets are used while addressing the other person. Krishna sometimes uses two quite often, not very often, but many, sometimes few times he uses it. But here, three epithets are used. So, Prutak Keshi Nishudana. Oh, you are the killer of the Keshi demon. So, please destroy my illusion, my misconception. Tyagasya Charishi Kesha Tyagasya Charishi Kesha Prutak Keshi Nishudana Prutak Keshi Nishudana So, here, What's going on is asking about the difference between the two of these. So that he, now he has more or less understood that Krishna doesn't want him to renounce the world, that Krishna wants him to fight. But he wants to get it right that I will actually be fighting with detachment. Now Krishna's answer goes over many steps. But before we go that, let's recite the words together. Sanyasyasya Mahabaho Tattvam Ichami Veditum Tyagasya Charashi Kesha Prithak Keshi Nishudana So 
Now, the approach of the Gita in general is while it is discussing many technical levels of practice, it does not get into too much technicalities of terms. There are several places in Arjuna's, in this 8th chapter, for example, he asks, What is Adi Buddha? What is Adi Daiva? Even in 13th chapter, Arjuna asks, What is Kshetra Kshetra Kya? So, Krishna does not get into a hair splitting definition of things. He focuses on the essential principle and the essential purpose. So, here also, Krishna does not go too much into things. But he gives too much into technicalities. But he does give a concise reply. He says, Kamyanam Karmanam Nyasam. Kamyanam Karmanam Nyasam. So, Nyasa is the same as Sanyasa. Kamyanam Karma. So, the work which we des des do to get the, some desires fulfilled. That kind of work. Sanyasam Kavayovidu. When one gives that up, that is called sanyas. So generally speaking, when somebody is in the householder stage, or any stage before that, they are they need some material things in their life. It could be necessities, it could be wants, whatever it is. But they need that. And for that they do the okay, I may do a job, I may do this, I may do that. So when Krishna says, Krishna says, when that kind of work is given up, even sannyasis can't give up all work. They have to do their prayers. They have to do their uh, sadhana, whatever it is. So, but when one gives us, gives up kamya karma, that is sannyas. Sannyasam kavayo viduhu. Sannyasam kavayo viduhu. And then he says, sarva karma falatyagam. That on one side, some category of work or major category of work, when somebody gives it up, that is sannyas. Whereas in all work, if one gives up attachment to the fruits of the work, prahus tyagam vichakshana, that Arjuna is defined as, is called as tyaga. Sarva karma phala tyagam, tyagam. prahus tyagam vichakshana. So now when Krishna answers Arjuna's question, we discussed earlier how the same question asked repeatedly should not be given the same answer repeatedly. So one is answer from different perspectives. That is good and Krishna has done that once before in the fifth chapter. But another expert way to answer is that if the same question is asked, say for example, um, why is there tension between India and Pakistan? Now, at the start of a, of a course on history, somebody may say, okay, because the because there are religious differences, because there is a regional conflict, because one country feels insecure, whatever, we might give some reasons. Now, if somebody does a course on history, maybe for three months, six months, and then the question comes, okay, why does why is the tension between India and Pakistan? Then there will be what we have learned in that course should also be included so that that answer doesn't just become from another perspective but that rather that answer integrates what we have learned so what krishna will do is here he will answer the question of the difference between tyaga and sannyasa rather renounced action and the mood of renunciation precisely this difference can be as tyaga and sannyasa Sanyasa is renunciation of work. Tyaga is renunciation in work. We are working, but that renunciation is there within our work. So, this difference Krishna will answer using a something which he has taught in the previous chapters and that is the modes. So the modes is a concept which Krishna has specifically elaborated on in the 14th chapter. It is also used in the 17th chapter. So now Krishna will answer Arjuna's question using the mode, idea of the modes. 
So that way what happens is the the answer, not only the answer gets further illuminated, but the new concept that we have learned also gets integrated. So it's like say at 5.1 there is an the answer. Then now in chapter 14 there is the modes. So now in 18.1 the answer using modes. So the first thing Krishna will say is that that when we talk about renouncing at that time the action now you can say the action of renunciation renunciation of action is there but you can talk about action of renunciation also that when we do the deed of renouncing at that time renunciation the underlying motivation with what conception with what motivation we are doing it that will determine whether the renunciation, renunciation falls in sattva rajas or tamas and he says that if the renunciation is in the mode of ignorance, then that is of no use. Similar in Rajas also, it's not really of great use. So let's look at it quickly, what Krishna says, because there's a lot of territory to cover in this chapter. But I, I don't want to just answer the question. Uh, I also want to uh, give an outline of the chapter. So Krishna says, So niyatasya tu sannyasa karmano no papadyate. Krishna says, our karma should never be given up. But moha tasya parityakas. If one does, when this gets into illusion and with no proper understanding, yes, I just don't want to do this. They renounce it. That is in the mode of ignorance. Now, the mode of ignorance, Krishna does not elaborate very much because ignorance is so bad that that is not even an option for Arjuna. Mm -hmm. So, elaboration on ignorance is ignored by Krishna. It's like if somebody wants to buy gold and now gold may look like uh, maybe some other metal which is polished. So we have to tell the person, okay, when you are going for gold, look for this, this, this. But when you are going to ask for gold, when somebody wants to buy gold, we don't have to tell them, don't buy potatoes. <laughs> now, so that is so different in one sense that if somebody mistakes a potato to be gold, then you know they have a potato head. <laughs> so now Krishna will say, Rajasik ignorance, Rajasik renunciation is what? He says, Kaya Klesha Bhayat Tejit. So that, oh, this is so troublesome. So I'll not do it. Kaya Klesha. Kaya is body. Klesha is distress. Bhaya is fear. Oh, this is so troublesome. I don't, I don't want to do this. So when one sees it, the only consideration for announcing is that this is so troublesome. Now, should that be one consideration? Of course. But if that is the only consideration, see, if one's life's decisions are based simply on which is the path that will cause the least trouble, well, we are not meant simply to have a problem-free life. We want a purposeful life. And for the sake of a purpose, if it is meaningful for us, we want, we are even ready to take up some problems. So anything worthwhile we do, what we want is, that we want our life, we want it to be problem free. Yeah, nobody wants the life to be problem full. That is true. But is problem, being problem free, the so should it be the sole basis for decision making? It says no, we want our life to be purposeful. This is much more important. It's just like, do we want to be pain free? Yes, of course we want to be pain free. But is being pain free the purpose of life? No, many times if somebody wants to say become fitter, they want to build their muscles. 
they'll go and go to gym and lift weights and that causes pain. So if somebody's purpose is only to be pain free, then they're never going to become fitter. So Krishna says that if renunciation is simply because, oh, this is so problematic, that's not going to work. And if somebody thinks I'll become a brahmachari because, oh, this material world is so complicated. There's so many problems here. Well, even the brahmachari ashram is in the material world only. <laughs> so if we run away from the world because there are problems here, and if we come to the renounced order and there are problems there, then where will we go then? Isn't it? We should. If somebody wants to renounce the world, it has there has to be a higher purpose for it. The purpose could be I want to serve Guru, Guru and Krishna, I want to share Krishna's message, I want to focus more on absorbing myself in Krishna and sharing that. There could be many purposes like that. But the point is that if the primary focus is just being problem free, that's not going to work very well. So then he just says this is not to be this is in the mode of passion. And then he says in your detachment, you can do your work, but do not be fixated on the results. Then after that, Krishna starts going into an analysis. So he says that why should we be detached from the results? Because there are multiple factors involved in action leading to result. So this is where like Krishna will talk about the five factors of action. We see, we think that I do action and I get the result. It's that simple. But Krishna says it's not that simple. So he talks about five factors of action. So he will analyze karma and he says actually when we work in our life, we have to understand how karma works. So Panch, so I will recite this verse. I will just recite it. I will explain it. Panchaitani Mahabaha. Panchaitani is five. Hmm? Karanani Nibodhami. Arjuna, understand them properly. Sankhe Krutante Proktani. That's by Sankhya, this are talking about. Siddhaye Sarvakarmana. Siddhaye means from work, Siddhi, success. For the success of work, these five factors are involved. So let us look at the five factors. This 14th verse. Adhishthanam. Adhishthanam is the place where we are working, the venue of action, tatha karta, the doer, adhishthanam tatha karta, adhishthanam tatha karta, so karanam, karanam is the senses, the instruments with which you do our action, karanam chaprutak vidham, there are various kinds of senses that may be involved at different times. Karanam cha prithak vidham. Karanam cha prithak vidham. Then, this, that is all the vividhas cha prithak cheshta. We have to try different kinds of endeavors. Cheshta. Vividhas cha prithak cheshta. Vividhas cha prithak cheshta. And then, he says daiva. Daiva is the fifth factor. Isn't? Daiva chaivatra. Certainly in, among this. Chaiva, it is certainly Panchamam is the fifth factor. Daivam Chaivatra Panchamam. Daivam Chaivatra Panchamam. So let's recite this together. Adhishthanam Tatha Karta Karanam Cha Prithak Vidham Vividhas Cha Prithak Cheshta Daivam Chaivatra Panchamam. So now, in trying to understand this, so if there is an action here and there is the result here, so if we consider there is a bridge in between the two of them, that bridge has five planks to it. So let's try to understand these five planks, which you know, you know the meaning of the word planks, the logs of wood which link together. So there are these five planks in the bridge. Well, the first thing that is required of course is the karta. Karta is the soul. Then there is karanam. Karanam is the senses. Now, we will first understand the literal meaning of the words and then we will move forward to what it means in context. Then there is Adhishthan. 
Adishthan is the place. <coughs> then there is Cheshta. Cheshta is the endeavor. And finally there is the Daiva. That is destiny. So, if we look at these five factors, now the first is self-evident, isn't it that a somebody might be a top musician, but if they are dead and their dead corpse is lying over there, then they can't do any music. So the karta, the person has to be there. So no action without will happen without the doer. So if somebody is asleep, they can't do much at that time. So the doer has to be present over there. Now after that, the senses refer to not just the physical sense. Of course it refers to that, but it refers to something more. Say, let's consider right now we are sitting over here and we are having this uh, session on the Bhagavad Gita. So now, I as a speaker need to be here, you as the hearer need to be there. So these are, we are all the kartas. Now after that, we need to have our senses right. So for example, if I am going to give a, the class, my throat needs to be functional. So each activity requires a particular set of senses. So for all of you, say if some of you have, as, if one of you has some ear issues and you are not able to hear for some reason, then the action of studying or teaching or learning the Bhagavad Gita will not happen properly. So it refers to the particular senses, senses which are required for that particular action. But it is not just the senses. You know, senses are associated with certain skills. So everybody speaks. But not everybody speaks as fluently. Not everybody speaks as attractively. There is the voice itself. Some people have a very sweet voice. Some people have a little raspy voice. And then beyond that, there is the vocabulary. There is the method of delivery. So all that comes up. So if a, if a sports, like say cricket, now everybody has hands, everybody has legs, but a batsman or a baller, they need to have their hands so properly, maybe the hands have to have strong enough muscles to hit the ball or to throw the ball. So there are senses with the proper set of skills required. Proper you could call it skills, abilities, and these two are slightly different, but whatever it is. So they are required. Now, if we are sitting and having this discussion in a crowded vegetable market, <laughs> that will not work. You may be interested in learning, I may be interested in teaching. But unless there is the right place, things won't work. So, I may be a good speaker, you may also be a good hearer. But still, without the Adishthana, things will not work. So, Adishthana is the place. So, by place, we refer to the, not just the place, it has to be suitable for the action. So, now, if say a cricket match is to be played, then we need a ground which is big enough. And not just big enough, if the ground is thorny or rocky, no, we have to have a proper pitch over there with the proper grass around it. So venue is required. And then after we have the right venue, so if you will see, after this, now it will start moving towards somewhat invisible factors. That, say, there is a music concert to be done. And we are in a proper hall, which is meant for such musical performances. And there's one player who comes and performs. Another player comes and performs. And one player, it's delightful. The audience is clapping and cheering. 
and the second player comes and the audience is mocking and jeering. Why? Because maybe the first player has practiced. Both of them have raw talent. But the first player has practiced. By practice, they have refined their skills. And then they have become masterly in that particular area. So endeavor means practice. It means discipline. It means diligence, dedication. So, it, so now, now after all these are right, still sometimes things may not work out. So the destiny has to be involved. So, since every, so somebody might be a fit player, in form, I say the fit batsman, in form, on a pitch that is a batting paradise. Now, at that time, we say this player will score a century, a double century, this or that. This, that's what everybody is expecting. But in the world, many things can go wrong. So maybe at that time itself, there is a pandemic that comes up across the world and the match gets cancelled. There is a terrorist attack. Things can go wrong. So, this player may bat very well, but then some fielder just takes a spectacular catch. Something is just unbelievable. And now, this player's endeavor is there, but somebody's endeavor else endeavor comes in. So, you, you know, there is this whole idea, what common people talk as luck. You know, luck, fortune. They may not use the word destiny, but this is a fact. Now, this is something which we can't control. <clears throat> However, there are things in our control. If you consider now among these factors, when we are trying to do some activity and say we are not getting success, say if you are studying engineering and say you're not doing as well as you like academically, Say, if I am giving classes and somehow I am not having the impact that I think I should be having or that I am seeking. So then, what could be the reason for it? So we can use these factors broadly to analyze. Now, destiny is something which we all have. Whatever it is, we can't control it. But if when something doesn't work, I just jump or maybe it's not my destiny. Then that is being short-sighted. That is being irresponsible. I have to, in, I have to, we have to practice. Arjuna, we see that he clearly had a great talent for Arjuna. But along with talent, he practiced. He practiced diligently. One of the reasons he has the name Gudakesha is that he would stay awake at night practicing what his teacher had taught him during the day. And that's how he became a champion archer. So that is also important. He may have the destiny in the sense that he may have the ability, the natural talent, but talent itself is not enough. There has to be something more than that. <clears throat> so now, if we look at, if we are not getting success, there are three broad possibilities why we may not get success. And then we can evaluate. First is that it could be, is the work that I am doing incompatible? That means, say, if somebody is a musician and then they basically they have talent for music but maybe they are trying to become a business person well everybody needs to know something in life nobody can be say oblivious about the financial aspect but if they get too caught in the commercial aspect itself it's not going to work isn't it so is the work incompatible 
that's what we should look at first so that, that that's we'll see what that means but is the place inhospitable so for example if somebody lives in a place somebody said 25 years ago in america they wanted to play cricket and nobody there knows what is cricket they may have great talent for cricket but if nobody knows it nobody is going to encourage it nobody is going to watch it then they can't develop that talent over there so is the place in hospital if somebody wants to somebody has a great interest in say computer science but they live in a remote tribe where nobody has a computer nobody has interest in computer nobody even understand what a career in computer means then if they want to develop that career they cannot be in that place that place is in hospital the third is is my endeavor insufficient so is it that things are right uh, i have the right skill set i am in the right place but i have just not endeavored enough i have to work hard if you look at these three factors from uh, inaction from the life of shri prabhupad now prabhupad is a pure devotee and uh, his life is orchestrated by krishna but that does not mean that we can not look at it from a practical perspective and learn lessons so you know nishla prabhupad as a pharmacist now he spent almost 30 40 years in that particular role but then prabhupad was by nature a teacher a teacher so people would come to him for medicine and while giving medicine prabhupad would start teaching them. he tried his best to be a businessman and it was not that he was unsuccessful but he was not spectacularly successful that's not what he was meant to do then shri prabhupad said let me preach and he started focusing on preaching in india so shri prabhupad preaching in india now he tried earnestly prabhupada actually started the back to god magazine in the middle of the time when the second world war was going on and he said that the world doesn't just need material peace it also needs spiritual understanding and that's how he started it and he, if you see the early back to god it's prabhupada wrote on very contemporary issues at that time he would take some comment from a newspaper editorial and he would elaborate on that so prabhupad tried to be contemporary prabhupad tried to explain but at that time india was too caught in politics india was too infatuated by the west uh, india was too crippled by poverty so it was just not the hospitable place were people pious yes of course people were pious but their piety meant that they were interested in hearing some nice katha about krishna they were not interested in philosophy so the place was inhospitable now prabhupada tried for almost 10 years prabhupada was trying in india he opened a whole organization in jhansi the league of devotees and even got some elite people from jhansi to come for the inauguration of that organization but somehow it just didn't work the place was not hospital then prabhupad went to america now when he went to america at that time also success didn't come overnight prabhupad later told his disciples that so many times he thought maybe i should just go back to india prabhupad had come to america on a two month visa and he kept extending that visa but each time he had to extend it to me what is the point over here is anything at all going to work so shri prabhupad in america in primarily 1965 and early 1966 so 
so hardly anything seemed to be working out so there it was prabhupad kept trying prabhupad kept meeting different people talking with them and finally he found the people who were really interested were the people who were in the counter culture the world would call, call them hippies but these people were people who were the right audience for him even in america it was not that all of america was right for him and prabhupad found the audience so there endeavor was required so endeavor is important but endeavor is required with the right skill set in the right place now somebody who has not a single musical bone in their body somebody who can't even understand the difference between say one tune and another tune or one pitch and another pitch is it okay i'll become a professional musician uh, okay how no matter how much they try that's unlikely to happen so these three factors we can consider before we consider whether my action is going to bring the result or not so now sometimes it may be that all these three factors are right and still the result may not come and there are some authors my field is writing primarily so that's why i know about authors there are some authors who wrote many books throughout their lives and they died more or less unknown and even penniless and after they died their books became famous it's happened with some movies also when say when they are produced they just they are like a flop on the box office but afterwards maybe several years later they are released on youtube and they become cult classics that so things are unpredictable in this world so that person's product was meant to become famous but that person never got to enjoy the fame <laughs> so daiva can work in mysterious ways but so while so we could say hmm, there is a mystical element mystical i am using in the sense that that so there is a something which just doesn't make there is a mystery to it there is something just beyond rational so i'm using mystical as the opposite of rational so when we are working we need to consider the rational side and not just jump exp- take explanations to the mystical side once a devotee wrote to prabhupad saying that gopal i'm suddenly feeling unnaturally lusty i think some lusty ghost has possessed me prabhupad say nothing we just chant hari krishna <laughs> so he said that just chant hari krishna avoid, avoid temptation avoid uh, exposing yourself to temptations and pray to krishna but there is no need to jump to some mystical explanation you know, there is some sexually mad ghost who is out there and who is using me to fulfill his desires well okay is that a possibility well everything can be a possibility <laughs> is it it but there is no need to jump to the the, the non rational explanation it's i'm not saying it's irrational it's non rational in the sense that we can analyze it rationally very easily so we when things are not working out we look at these factors and then we see how to move forward in our lives so krishna gives this analysis and then he says when we do action at that time what causes bondage is we discuss earlier was the motivation for the action but krishna will say that okay when you are doing action there are multiple components in the action so in terms of krishna telling arjuna to fight over him so why is he talking about all this this seems to be quite a complicated philosophical discussion to do on a battlefield especially now that the bhagavad gita is coming towards its end it's not that uh, krishna and arjuna had planned a timed conversation okay you know we have uh, you know like uh, if a tennis match is going on in between a game you know if the tennis player and the coach if we can then take and talk for 30 seconds or 1 minute otherwise the time is out you have to go away it's not like a timed conversation but still they didn't have infinite time over there so it is not that necessarily arjuna is aware now the time for bhagavata is going to get over it's a natural conversation going on but still 
it's a complex concept be in in be explained over here so why does krishna talk about this his emphasis is that don't think of yourselves as the only doer that is the key point there are multiple factors involved so with respect to doership mm, we are the soul doers that is one illusion we are not a doer at all that is another illusion we are one of the factors in doership So when Krishna says prakate kriyamana, that verse is there. Karta hamiti manyate. That is an illusion. That doesn't mean that we are not the doers. It says that if we are the sole doers, thinking that I am the only doer, and I am doing it, why is it not happening? Yeah, you may be doing it, but do you have the skill set for it? Are you in the right place? Have you endeavored enough? Is destiny favorable? There are so many factors to be considered. So, one who thinks that they are the sole doers, they are in illusion. That's why Krishna, that's what exactly Krishna will say in the next verse. Tatraivam, tatraevam, satikartaram. The, the doer, these two, uh, the chase of the true doer, atmanam kevalam tuyaha. One who says, I am the sole doer. Such a person is pashyatya akrita buddhitvan. They are seeing, but their intelligence is akrita buddhitvan. It's not well informed. If the intelligence has not done its homework. Akruta. It has not done the necessary background work. Nasa pashyati durmati. He is such a person does not see properly. So, if, that's why when success comes, if we become elated, it's such a, I am a great person. I have achieved so much. And I become proud. That's unhealthy because <coughs> there's so many other factors which have worked out. Tomorrow those factors may not be there. I may not. Be able that successful. On the other hand, failure comes, oh, I am a terrible loser. That's also not very healthy. So we see that I am one factor among the actions. So, tatraivam satikartaram Tatraivam satikartaram Atmanam kevalam tuyaha Atmanam kevalam tuyaha Pashyatya kutabuddhitva Pashyatya kutabuddhitva Nasa pashyati durmati hi. Nasa pashyati durmati hi. So, basically what happens is, if I think I am the sole doer, then I will have these like, like super extremes. I am a champion. I am the greatest. And otherwise, I am worthless. I am just good for nothing at all. We all will experience loss in life. Now loss is the event. And then we all ascribe some meaning to the event. So an objective sense of meaning could be, I have lost. Okay, I gave this interview, I applied for this particular internship. I, I tried to do this, it didn't work. I have lost. That's one level. Now, a far more damaging is, I am lost. So it's not just about this, it's more of a, it's I have lost is more of a situation. In this particular situation, it did work out. I am lost means it's direction. I just don't know where to go, I'm lost. But the most damaging meaning would be, I am am a loser. Now this goes to the level of self-definition itself. Uh, if, it, if we go to that level, I am a loser. This is where depression comes in. This is where low self-esteem comes in. And ultimately this is where suicidal ideation, suicidal thoughts and suicide comes in. So this is toxic. This is a very dark path. Dep this is where Many of the mental health problems, they come up because we ascribe wrong meanings to our life's events.
Oh, this didn't work out, therefore I'm a loser. Now this can also be applied in our attempts at sense control. We all may take some time. So if I am trying to control my senses, first of all, karanam. What is the capacity of my sense? If somebody tries to fast, according to Ayurveda, there's kapha vata pitta prakriti, and each prakriti doesn't find it equally easy to fast. For some, for some people, especially kapha prakriti, it is relatively easy to fast. Fast. For those with vata prakriti, it is almost impossible to fast. So not that it's, it's uh, sorry with pitta prakriti. It's almost impossible to fast. fast. But the point is, do I have the necessary skill sets? For my, are my senses suitable for that? Is my body suitable for that? Then. Am I in the right place? Right, if I'm trying to pass, I'm trying to control my senses. So if I am working, if I am fasting and I am working in the Govindas restaurant, where either I'm cooking food or I'm serving the food and I'm seeing all the delicacies that everybody's eating. Well, that's not the right place for fasting, is it? <laughs> It like if somebody wants to torture themselves, <laughs> and then maybe that is the place to go to while fasting. But that's not the best place. And the thirdly is, have I endeavored properly? You know, that means maybe I need to, see fasting cannot just be a one-time event. We need to overall regulate our diet, our body's digestive patterns become proper. Maybe... I have to plan properly, I have to endeavor properly. So that, that endeavor could mean talking with those who fast regularly. Okay, what all do you do? What, what can be done about this? We learn things. So it with sense control also it's like that. So maybe we try to fast, once it works, second time, once first it doesn't work, second time it doesn't work, third time it doesn't work. Gradually we learn, okay, this is what I can do, these are my capacities, it grows. So this applies for everything in life. So Krishna says, don't claim soul doership don't think that it is because of you the war is happening you are not the soul doer at the same time you are not the non-doer also there is a bigger set of factors happening and you are going to play one part in it then after this krishna will analyze the various components of action so he'll say that we try to keep the various components of action in the mode of goodness. So this is a bit of a technical section. I won't go too much into the technicalities. But Krishna explains that when we do action, there are certain factors involved. So I, these two verses talk about these factors, 18 to 19. But without this, each word has a technical meaning and then Krishna shows how that meaning relates with the specific list that he's going to give. But without going into this technical part, let's look at one verse over here. Jnanam karma cha karta cha Jnanam karma cha karta cha Tridhaiva guna bheda taha Tridhaiva guna bheda taha So see, when we are acting, there are various components involved in action. So first of all, we perceive things. Without perception, nothing can happen. So for example, if you're sitting here and suddenly the door opens and a tiger is, you know, there. <laughs> so that jnana will lead to the karma. Run away from here. <laughs> so there is perception and there is action. And then there is the karta. There is a doer. So basically, the components of action, if you want to see so Krishna will broadly say that we can try to get to be able to act with detachment. We try to get as many of the components of action as possible towards the mode of goodness. So in action, say the first stage is jnana. Jnana is not so much knowledge here as perception. Jnana is what is acquired with the karma indriya. Now, and there is karma. That is the action that we do. Now, there is of course the karta. Jnana, karma and karta are there. Now, along with that, 
when an action is to be done there is a motive for the action the motive generally is sukha we all want happiness in life so so for example if a if the door opens and we say hey there's a there's a table with a nice large cake over there oh i want to eat it it is enjoyable we want to go there so sukha is the motive for us now when we are trying to i will integrate this diagram later but let me first broadly explain so gyana is what we take in information then krishna says there is also buddhi and there is dhruti i'll explain how these three work buddhi buddhi is what intelligence and dhruti is determination so how does krishna explain buddhi and dhruti over here so first of all buddhi is different from gyana gyana is the information that we take in buddhi is how we decide to translate intention into action when i intelligence is say okay if i see a snake slithering in from there okay i have to run away maybe that door is further this door is closer but there are too many people over here they all were going to run this door so maybe i should run that door that's intelligence intelligence is by which we decide how to translate intention to action intelligence is how we translate this is the specific in this context intelligence can have many definitions but when i have a particular thing to do okay what should i do in this situation how should i go about doing it and then determination is what have help us to persist in this translation persist in this translation by so i may have intelligence for example if someone wants to say if they feel that i am overweight i want to lose some weight the intelligence may be that okay maybe i have to do more exercise maybe i have to avoid these kind of foods and then intelligence might be there okay but then after that the determination has to be there to keep doing it now it's interesting krishna will say all these three can be in the three modes the gyana can be in the three modes the intelligence can be in the three modes and determination can be in the three modes so let's try to look at these so to put it all together now when we act so gyana comes in to the karta and then the karta is going to do the karma so if we consider this to be the self so information has come into the self and action has come out of the self now uh, here you could say there are broadly there is the buddhi okay i got this information what should i do now then there is dhruti is determination and then there is sukha so why am i putting all these before karma in one sense these drive our action isn't it okay we all are going to act but we use our intelligence to decide how to act we have our determination by which we determine how long am i going to act and then we have a certain conception of pleasure based on which we act so let's just take one example of these three things to illustrate how these three work so i'll talk about dhruti how the buddhi and dhruti dhruti is determination how determination can also be in the three modes krishna talks about each of these in the three modes but let's focus on one of them so 
So Krishna says right at the beginning, Yaya dharmam adharmam cha. That which is right, a person thinks to be wrong. Karyam cha ka. Okay, what happened? Sorry. Sorry, not this one. This one. Adharmam dharmam itiya. That which is wrong, one thinks to be right. Manyate tamasavrata. The person is covered by ignorance. Adharmam dharmam itiya. Adharmam dharmam itiya. Manyate tamasavrata. Manyate tamasavrata. Sarva arthan. In all purposes, viparita mishya. The person comes to the exact opposite conclusion. Sarvarthan vipari tamscha. Sarvarthan vipari tamscha. Buddhi sapar. Such, such in, what happened? I didn't go to buddhi. Okay, let's take buddhi only. Maybe. Okay, any of these is fine. Buddhi sapartha. Such buddhi, Krishna is saying, is tamasi. Buddhi sapartha tamasi. Buddhi sapartha tamasi. Now, Intelligence can be used to arrive at a proper understanding of things. And then that understanding is the basis of action. Different people can take in the same facts and they may arrive at completely different understandings. So in when the intelligence is in the mode of ignorance, then a person's realization is the exact opposite of what it is. Once an alcohol campaign, anti-alcohol campaigner, he gave a talk to a set of alcoholics of the audience. He told them how dangerous alcohol is. And they said, now I'll demonstrate to you. So he had a bowl in which he had, a, not a bowl, he had a small beaker in which an insect had been trapped. Mm -hmm. Or rather, he had a beaker in which there was some alcohol. It is half of it was full, transparent. And then he had another small box, the bee in which he had got an insect. So he opened that dibby and just hurled that insect into the bottle, into the beaker. And the insect fluttered around, fluttered around struggling. And within moments, it just sank down dead. Just, I want to demonstrate how dangerous alcohol is. It will kill you. So he looked at everyone. So what do you learn from this? And everybody was looking down. And one person was very cheerful. A bright smile. Yes, what do you learn? Since when I drink alcohol, all the germs and worms in my intestine will die. <laughs> so, Sarvartha Viparita Amsha. <laughs> you arrive at the conclusion that is the exact opposite of what is to be arrived at over there. That is buddhi sa partha tamasi. That, you know, when they, with respect to cigarettes, when they started demonstrating, they started, they were, the companies were forced by the regulatory agencies to put that cigarette smoking is injurious to health. At least initially, what happened was they marketed in such a way that actually people who are courageous, people who are heroic, people who are adventurous, they all drink cigarettes. They all smoke cigarettes. So when they put this warning signal, actually it triggered the daredevilishness in people. And for some time, cigarette sales increased. So that is Sarvarthan Viparitamsha. Then, okay. Yaya dharmam adharmam cha. What is right? What is wrong? Karyam cha karyam eva cha. What is to be done or not done? Ayathavat prajanati. Buddhi sapath rajasi. That if one is not able to understand clearly, one is confused. If this is to be done, that is to be done. In Rajoguna, what happens is a person has many, many desires. And they are pulled by different desires. And said, hey, I want to work hard and become famous. But I want to enjoy right now, I want to party. So, okay, do you want to work or do you want to party? I want to do both. You can't do both. Isn't it? There are desires which pull people in different directions. And their intelligence is not able to figure out. Ayathavat prajanati. Just doesn't have a clear understanding of what is really important. Now, this is not blind. The tamasik is just, it's completely distorted. 
but here ayathavat. So rajoguna is not the same as tamoguna. Sometimes we equate rajoguna and tamoguna, but rajoguna enables for people to work work hard, and sometimes they work constructively also. They can do one extraordinary things in rajoguna, but often their priorities are not clear. Now this goes forward. We don't have time right now. Then Krishna will talk about sukha. How that which tastes like poison in the beginning will taste like nectar in the end. And that which tastes like nectar in the beginning will taste like poison in the end. And like that he talks about the various modes. And why is he talking about all this? He says that by understanding all this, we try to put our buddhi in goodness, we try to jiti in goodness, we try to understand, have a definition of happiness that is in goodness. Then it's more easy, relatively speaking for us, to situate ourselves in goodness and then our actions will naturally be in goodness. Then Krishna says, okay, goodness is good, but it's not good enough. That we have to rise above goodness. While being in goodness, we need to function, we need to function for a higher purpose. So Krishna talks about a system of Varanashram where different people have their roles in life. And after describing the typical characteristics of people in each of the modes, sorry, in each of the varanas. So the varanas are basically to help people in different modes function appropriately. Then he says, how to function in life. So we look at these few verses, these are quite important. So he says, this is a verse which is often mistranslated as work is worship. So we'll say what is missed in the mistranslation. Mm -hmm. So Krishna first starts with Yataha Pravrtir Bhutanam, from whom this all of existence is manifested. Yena Sarvam Idam Tatam, by whom all of this world is pervaded. Yataha Pravrtir Bhutanam. Yena sarvam idam tatam. Yena sarvam idam tatam. Svakarmana tam abhyarcha. Svakarmana tam abhyarcha. Abhyarcha is worship. So, Svakarmana, through your work, worship that Lord. And by this, Siddhim vindati, one can attain perfection. Manavaha, a human being. Siddhim vindati manavaha. Siddhim vindati manavaha. So if you look at the verse 1846c, that is, c is the ABC before lines, it is Swakarmana Tam Abhyarcha. So literally, if you look at it, it's a straightforward translation. Swakarmana by your work, through your work. Tam Abhyarcha. Worship that Lord. So what this verse is saying is. Through your work, worship the Lord. It is not work is worship. That's all. <coughs> Through your work, worship the Lord. He is not saying simply work is worship. Now, work is worship may be fine as an ethical principle. Ethical principle means, say, if there is a lot of uh, discrimination against some people who have to do some kind of work, some people are looked down upon, then there is no need to look down on those people. All work, so that means all work and all workers, they have some dignity to them. So, the idea of untouchability, what, whatever extent it was, it was, a, it was more of a hygienic idea to whatever extent it was. It was not a casteist idea. That some people who are doing a particular kind of work, they are likely to be infected, so they have to be a little careful. But it was never meant to be a socially imposed way of discriminating against people. Of course, it became like that and that's horrendous. But the idea is, if we consider work as worship to mean that all work and all workers should have a basic level of dignity, that's definitely true. And that Krishna is already implying also, if through your work you can worship the Lord, 
that means the work is not profane the work is not sinful the work is not so dark and dirty that it is completely disconnected from god but the key difference is work is worship means that there is no need for any other object of worship so basically work becomes a replacement to god and that is what krishna is saying now that's not what he is saying he is saying basically as is normally the understanding is god is up here in the spiritual world the spiritual level this is we are in the material level and we think that if i have to become liberated i have to go to god and that is true but it's only partially true why because krishna exists everywhere krishna doesn't just exist in the spiritual world krishna exists in this world also so when we are doing this this is worship that this is where we are worshiping the lord say we come in the morning we chant the holy names we do our thing this is worship and then after that once we have infused that mood of worship into our heart we remember this lord whom i am worshiping right now is everywhere this lord is in my office this lord is in my college this lord is in my home this lord is in the road in which on which i travel to get to my work so then we can work as worship it's not work is worship it's work as a form of worship that lord i can serve through my work also now somebody may say oh but this world has so many problems so there are so many things wrong in this world sometimes you know we have to do things which are not not proper spiritually which are not proper morally that this is the nature of the world krishna says yes that's true but don't fixate on that he says that oh the, the gita is a very in one sense a realist book see in education there is always this tension so what is the tension in education it is not just how will how will i pass the exam no that may be the tension of the students but the educators when they are giving education about the world see so how much should it be we are describing the world as it should be and how much should we be taking the world as it is the tension between them say so for example when parents are raising their children the parents should tell the children speak the truth the everybody should speak the truth but should the parents also not tell the children that that sometimes people lie and sometimes not that lying is good but sometimes we have to be aware that people lie and sometimes we may also not the speaking the full truth may not be the best thing to do so how much do we speak the world as it is it should be this is idealism and this is realism so the best education is a blend of the two if it's only idealism then it will become impractical that person will not be able to function if it's only realism then soon the person will become immoral unprincipled because for we realistic okay that's so okay i make this shortcut i make that shortcut i make the that shortcut so krishna says that we work with a good intention but we acknowledge that sometimes there will be faults in this life so let's look at this verse okay so he says that just as fire fire is considered sacred but smoke covers the fire so similarly he says that everything in this world sahajam sahajam means that born with in born karma kaunteya it's born with karma arjuna sadosham faults are there in every activity that we do api natyajet 
don't give it just because that and he was the example sarva rambha hi doshena all endeavors are covered by fire just as fire is covered by smoke dhume agni ribavrta let's recite the verse together sahajam karma kanteya sadosham api na tije sarva rambha hi doshena dhume agni ribavrta so dhume agni just as fire is covered by smoke so krishna said yes it's going to be difficult for you to fight against bhishma uh, and drona but life never offers us very straight forward choices sometimes but very rarely is it this side is full good and this side is full bad there are sometimes like that but there are many times when there is some good over here some bad over here some good over here some bad over here. we cannot just uh, expect a utopia so in so what is krishna describing over here this is where he is describing karma yoga he now this last chapter is also like the gita summarized krishna is drawing his message towards the end so here the first few verses more or less from 41 to 48 krishna will talk about karma yoga then 49 to 54 he talks about karma yoga which culminates in bhakti yoga so in 54 he will the famous verse is there that brahmano hi pratishtaham no not brahma bhuta prasannatma na shochati na kamsha so through gyan yoga one attains the perfection and when when one attain the perfection after that what happens mad bhakti labhate para that person attains bhakti bhakti is the highest and then after this krishna will say that okay actually you don't have to go all this way you can just directly practice bhakti from wherever you are sarva karmanya api sada kurvano madya pashya ha that you will talk about this broadly from 56 to 62 63 is the last verse where he speaks he essentially is summarizing the same thing he says yes krishna integrates what he has taught before he says yes these modes are there the material nature is there but above the material nature is the lord so if you try to serve the lord then you will be able to engage material nature in a way that will take you closer to the lord and then in 63 arjuna stops so krishna stops and says now arjuna i have given you the message now you contemplate and do as you desire he says vimrishyatat vimrishya means contemplation etat asheshena as long as required and then yathechasi tathakuru do as you desire so here krishna here the gita reveals a god who respects human intelligence and appeals to human independence so one of my friends is in america he was trying to he lives in southern part of america which is quite um, as i mentioned earlier quite christian evangelical so he wanted to write a book on the gita he said i'm thinking of writing a book called the 10 commandments of bhagavad gita <laughs> so I told him, please don't write such a book. <laughs> At least not with that title. He said, why? I said, the Gita's mood is not the mood of commandments. The Gita is giving choices and consequences. If you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this will happen. Now you decide what you write. So, while the idea of appealing to a Christian demographic is nice, but we we uh, want to convey the mood of the Gita also. so the mood of krishna in is the mood of a guide by the side he is with us 
कृष्णा मूड इज नॉट लाइक दैट ऑफ अ डी टी इन द स्काय फाय हाय ऑफ दे इज अ गाइड बाय द साइड एंड इज स्पीकिंग रीजनिंग विथ अर्जुन नाउ वेन अर्जुना हियर इज दिस अर्जुना बिकम्स डीप इन थॉट अर्जुन सर सिंह वॉट इज कृष्णा वॉन्ट मी टू डू सो दिस इज नाउ एटीन सिक्सटी थ्री टू सिक्स सिक्सटी थ्री टू सेवेंटी थ्री This is the highest example of Krishna's sweetness coming out. We'll discuss this briefly, and then we'll just look at the last verses. So, 1863, basically, he's giving the choice to Arjuna. What is your choice? What do you want to do? So, the mood over here is Krishna is not like a mm, deity high. in the sky somewhere high up there krishna is basically like the guide by the side and he tells now you do what you desire so at that time arjuna starts thinking she so oh, krishna said that in the second chapter krishna said that in the sixth chapter krishna said that in the 12th chapter krishna said that in the 10th chapter he doesn't think like that literally because there are no chapters over there it does not that Arjun, Arjun, krishna said ah panchadasho adhyaya so this is natural flow there but he's thinking krishna spoke that at that time and that at that time that at that time okay what should i be doing it's like a doctor uh, telling a parent whose child has got cancer that you know this this is the disease these are the options these are the options and these are the factors involved in each of these options for you no you do as you desire so arjuna it's a serious decision what is what is what is krishna said now when two people are very close to each other then they can communicate a lot even without speaking like just by a glance somebody can speak volumes okay we should do this we should take this issue sometimes two people are not close to each other they can scream volumes and nothing gets communicated this is it so Arjuna is thinking, what does Krishna want me to do? And Krishna is telling me, you do as you desire. But I want to know, what is Krishna's desire? So Arjuna's question here is, what is Krishna's desire? And therefore, now Krishna will start speaking. And Krishna will say. i will speak the most confidential knowledge in english there are intensifiers this is very important this is very 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 important this is four times okay kya you convey it is important but your vocabulary is very 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 poor <laughs> 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 okay just repeating the same intensifier doesn't really make it that important hmm? this is the single most important thing even if you forget everything else just remember this this one point can help you pass your exam this single insight can help you get a working understanding of the subject whatever is elaborate but this is actually a little more emphatic than very 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 important okay so what is krishna uses intensifiers in 64 to convey that what is going to speak is very special so let's look at what all inter- in- intensifiers are there sarva guhya tamam among all knowledge this is the most confidential bhuya ha again i'm going to speak this sarva guhya tamam bhuya ha sarva guhya tamam bhuya shuru me arjuna hear me paramam vacha these are the most important among all the words that i have spoken shuru me paramam vacha shuru me paramam vacha ishto si me you are dear to me and drudamiti is you, you are loved by me and it, i am determined to love you i am in this relationship for the long haul 
ಇಷ್ಟೋಸಿಮೆ ದೃಢಮಿತಿ therefore i am speaking these words te hitam for your benefit tato vakshami te hitam tato vakshami te hitam so what are the inter- intensifiers in this verse can you identify sarva guhya tamam that most confidential knowledge then paramam vacha yes see there can be many things are confidential but that it's not the same thing as very important like there is some ceremony going on and a baby come a small child the mummy i want to talk with you okay later no this is important okay tell me no i want to talk privately with you this what you know i lost my toy okay i don't want other kids to think i'm a fool so i don't want to tell over okay it's it's private but it's not very important isn't it <laughs> so if a wedding is about to happen and somebody comes and says you know the necklace of the bride was supposed to be that has been stolen that is really important that is private that is also important so when guhia is used guhia is used more in the sense of private than secret secret means nobody should be told about it private means it's not relevant for those outside the relationship so krishna is saying you have opened your heart to be arjuna therefore i am speaking this to you for because because we are in this close relationship so this is not only this is not only secret this is not only private go here but it's also paramam vacha among everything that i have spoken this is the most important then drudham drudham is the adjective for what drudham is the adjective it's a determined determined to do what ishta so it is krishna is not just a college professor giving a philosophy class no he is concerned about arjuna ishto sine i care for you i care for you that's why i'm speaking this and drudham miti i care for you and i will always care for you i am determined to care for you so ishta and drudham both of them are in intensifiers and then te hitam i am speaking this for your benefit so now earlier krishna has told that the devotee should be dridha in worshiping him satam kirtayanto ma yatantascha dridha pratah with determination but here krishna is saying that what i am asking you from you in this relationship i am also give, going to give in this relationship i want you to be determined but i am also going to be determined dridham because i am determined so then so it's like a doctor telling that yes now i'll tell you something in private that okay there are all these treatments what is that the side effect that side effect these are the most important things that i want to tell you tell you this is for your benefit i care for you i mean i want your child to get healthy so then krishna will speak the same words that is spoken earlier but with a different emphasis let's recite this together manmana bhav mad bhakto madya ji mam namaskuru ma mere vishasi satyam te prati jane priyo sine see now the difference here is mam evaishasi satyam te in the previously 934 it is mam evaishasi yuktu aivam atmana mat parayana ha so the difference is in the mood of urgency like a patient is admitted to be a patient is come to the hospital to be admitted and then doctor says okay you know you you pay your bills follow this exercise do this 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 and you will be cured now the there the emphasis is on the patient and what all the patient has to do but the patient is someone the doctor very much cares for the doctor will say when you just do these things you just fill this form you take care of these things i will make sure that you get cured but the onus is much more krishna is placing the onus the responsibility there the key point krishna is saying i will do all this so in 934 krishna is emphasizing what arjuna should be doing in 1865 krishna is emphasizing what i will do 
Why is that? Because it is said that Krishna's heart, Chakravarti Padi experience commented that Krishna's heart is overflowing with compassion. Krishna wants Arjuna to do the right thing. And therefore he says, I will do all this for you. I say, Pratijani, Pratiji, when we declare, I declare this to you. And then finally Krishna speaks what Ramanacharya calls the Charam Shloka of the Gita. This is the, this is the crest jewel among the words of the Gita. So let's recite it together. Sarva Dharman Paritya Mamekam Sharanam Raja Ahampam Sarva Papepyo Moksha Shami Mahasucha. So he says that Moksha is Shami. It's like a doctor telling that there are many other treatments, just forget all the other treatments. Just do this. And he says, even if there are any side effects, even if there are any complications, I guarantee I'll take care of everything. See, no doctor is wanting to take pliability, isn't it? In fact, a surgery is done, the patient or the patient's care, the patient's guardian has to sign a form, disclaimer, that if anything goes wrong, then I have consented to surgery voluntarily. But Krishna, so nobody wants to take liability. But Krishna is saying, I will take liability. Say, I am telling you this is the right thing to do. But even if it turns out, somehow something goes wrong, some complications come up. I will protect you from the reactions. So you have you have heard, you had different ideas of what is your dharma, kuru dharma, kshatriya dharma. I have given broad paths in which you can determine what to do. Karma yoga, jnana yoga, dhyana yoga, bhakti yoga. Shri said, you forget all this. Just do what I'm telling you to do. And I will free you from sinful reactions. Ma Shuchaha. This is the heart of Krishna coming out out of great eagerness. Now, previously, when in 7th chapter, Krishna talks about when somebody has to practice bhakti, he says, Yesham Tvantaka Tampapam Janana Punya Karmanam Te dvandva moha nirmukta bhajante mandra dvrataha It's one has to become free from all sinful reactions. Then one can practice bhakti determinately. But here Krishna is saying, however you are, you just practice bhakti, I will purify you. I will free you from sinful reactions. It's like say a mother is training, uh, uh, is training a growing child uh, in potty training. And mother says, you know, don't make a mess with your clothes. You know, go to the restroom and do your business there. And the small, the child, growing child, makes a mess of this. And then the mother says, don't come to me. First you clean yourself, then you come to me. And then the baby says, I don't know how to clean it. Then says, come over, I'll clean you. So, in 728, it is Krishna is saying, okay, you clean yourself up, then first come to me. But 1866, Krishna is saying, come here, I'll clean you up. <laughs> so, that is the love of Krishna's heart. And then, after that, Krishna says, this is a confidential message. This is not to be given to everyone. When he's talking about what? The 64 to 66. This idea that I will free you from all sinful reactions. This people can miss you. I can do whatever I want in Krishna's name and Krishna will purify me. If I do it in Krishna's name, it is not like that. Krishna says, those who have love for me and when they are going to act out of loving intention, then if there is any complication, I will protect them. I say, this is a confidential knowledge. You don't tell this to everyone. But then he says, I want it to be told the appropriate way to everyone. So Krishna says, three levels at, afterwards, at which you can connect with him. It's like, say, somebody has fallen in a well. And they can't come out. So somebody comes from outside and throws a rope. And they say, okay, you hold on this rope and I'll pull you out. Oh, no, no, no. no. Uh, my arms will pain so much if I have to hold on to the rope. And the person takes out the rope and you know, makes it, ties it in a nice, nice loop. And says, okay, just put this loop around your waist, I'll pull you out. And he says, oh, but you know, if I tie it around my waist, it will squeeze my waist and cause me so much pain in my waist, I can't do that. And that person says, okay, that person takes out the rope and then ties at the bottom of the rope a nice big tub. And says, okay, you sit in this tub, I'll pull you out. So, like that, Krishna says, first of all, you preach this message. You'll become very dear to me. Someone says, why are you preaching? Who is going to do that? This is so complicated. 
He says, okay, if you can't preach the message, at least study this message. I, say, I can't study it, you know, it's too complicated. And just hear this message. Just hear, sit inside this tub, I will pull you out. So, like that, Krishna is extending the rope of grace more and more. So, please just come to me. Connect with me at some level or the other. And then finally Krishna says, Arjuna, have you heard attentively? Is it has your illusion been dispelled? But this is the only question in the entire Gita that Arjuna asks. So no, so normally as Arjuna is asking questions. And now we may say that if at the end of a class, if a, say if a speaker asks, have you heard attentively? You know, you might take it, what do you mean? Are you insulting me? Are you implying that I am not attentive? So it can, it might come off as an insult, but it is not in Arjuna's context. Why? Because Krishna is aware that Arjuna was very agitated. His mind was disturbed. And on top of that, they are in the middle of a battlefield. Although there is no noise around, but still just the awareness is a battlefield. Everybody is waiting. That can be distracting. So Krishna is saying, either because of the external situation or the internal emotion, if you are not able to hear attentively, you tell me which part you are not able to hear, I am ready to repeat that. And if you have heard but you are not understood, then you tell me, I will repeat, I will explain again also. And then Arjuna says, Arjuna is overwhelmed with joy and gratitude. And he says, Krishna, I have understood. My illusion is dispelled. And Karishe Vachanam Tava, I will do your will. So this is the essential purpose of the Gita. Arjuna does not say, I will fight the war. Why? Because the Gita's focus has risen far above the circumstantial. It has gone to the universal level. At the universal level, the Gita's purpose is not just fighting, but it is harmonizing with the divine will. It is understanding that each one of us has a part in a higher plan. And we just play our part. Sometimes our part may be difficult, sometimes it may be easy. Sometimes our part may bring glory, sometimes our part may require us to be in anonymity. But we do our part. Karishe Vachinam Tava. I will do your will. The Gita could have ended over here. But from 74 to 78 are five more verses. And this is Sanjay speaking. And Sanjay's words actually demonstrate the Gita itself. Gita's teachings. How? In one sense, when Krishna speaks to Arjuna, the Gita's message, that is successful. But when Sanjay speaks the same message to Uttarashtra, is that successful? Uttarashtra has no change of heart. But it is successful. Because it is described that Sanjay's heart changes. Krishna to Arjuna is a success. That is Arjuna's heart changes. Sanjay to Dhritarashtra, it's and on this side, it's not a success. The Thrashtra heart does not change. But on Sanjay's side, there is success. Why? Because he becomes filled with remembrance. Not just remembrance, joyous remembrance. Rishyami cha mohur mohu, Rishyami cha puna puna. So he remembers Krishna's form and he remembers Krishna's message. So in one sense, the Gita's teachings go from Karma Yoga to Bhakti Yoga. So now at the, at the level of Karma Yoga, be detached from results. That is the teaching. And it shows how Sanjay himself is demonstrating this detachment from the results. There is no change in the heart of the Trashta, but he is not disturbed by it. In life's dualities, he is staying steady. But Bhakti Yoga says that, okay, when we work, the common, mess, common theme in both of them is work. We work, but we, we stay detached from results. In Bhakti Yoga, we work, and we also stay detached from results, but we also, we become attached to Krishna. Ultimately, this is the internal result that we all seek. Mai asakta manaha. 
and Sanjay's consciousness is demonstrating this internal result. Become attached to Krishna. He has become attached to Krishna and thus he is content. See in our life there is success and there is happiness. So our success is more in the world's eyes. Happiness is in our own experience. Now it is possible that we may get success as well as happiness. But in Arjuna's case, Arjuna is going to get success and happiness. In Sanjay's case, Sanjay is going to get happiness, although he doesn't get the success of his message. But both of them, both of them have become Krishna conscious. So the duality of this world is that just because we are Krishna conscious doesn't mean that all our material endeavors will be successful. We are still going to be affected, subjected to the dualities of the world in terms of success or failure. But the Gita's concluding example shows how actually even in failure, external failure, still we can have the success of the inner connection and the joy thereof. And in the last verse of the Gita concludes the prediction. Let's recite that verse. Yatra Yogeshwara All of you know the words, so let's do it together. Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna Yatra Patho Dhanurdhara Tatra Shirdhya Yogudir Dhruvani Dirmatir Mama So he says, wherever there is Krishna and where there is Arjuna, there there is victory, there is glory, there is opulence. There are all good things over there. Now interestingly, why is Arjuna needed over there? You could say, Krishna is the Lord. So where is where, where Lord Narayan is there, Lakshmi will be there. Where Krishna is there, success will be there. So why is Arjuna needed at, at all in this verse? The point is, the purpose of the Gita is not just to proclaim God's position. It is to transform man's disposition. That where there is God, there is success, there is victory, there is glory, that's all that is true. But therefore, we should be with God. We should be with God. And Arjuna is with God. So, there is faith. Hmm? Faith is at various levels. Initially, it is God is with me. Hmm? God is with me. That is God's love for us that He is with us. That He is as a Paramatma, He is with us. God's love. But I am with God. That is an expression of our love. So, I am with God. So, Karishye Vachnam Tava. By those words, Arjuna is saying showing that I am with you, o Krishna. And Yatra Partho Dhanurdharaha. That Arjuna who has lifted up his bow. What that signifies is that Arjuna has decided to do Krishna's will. Arjuna, and that's why the significance is yes, wherever there is God, there will be victory. But right now on the battlefield, Arjuna's disposition has been transformed. And therefore, it is the Pandava side that is going to be successful. So the Gita began with the Trashtra asking, what happened in the battlefield? So Sanjay says, bad news, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't use those words. But he says that basically, you are not, your side is not going to be successful. He doesn't say that, he says, the opposite, the side where Krishna and Arjuna is there is going to be successful. So now, this has a literal meaning that the Pandava side is going to be successful. But there is also a universal meaning. Non-literal meaning is that we are like our body like the chariot. And if we are with Krishna, then, then what will happen is we can also be successful in life. And that, with that note, the Gita concludes. So I'll summarize what we discussed. Maybe we started with the difference between Tyaga and Sannyasa. So here we discussed about how there is external renunciation, there is external renounce order and there is the internal 
disposition of renunciation. And Krishna says, focus on the modes. And through the modes, he says that we can look at if somebody is renouncing out of, say, for example, Rajas, the person is least trouble. This causes trouble, so I'll avoid it. That is not healthy, Krishna says. Then we talk about the five factors of action. Where we said that they form like a plank between five planks between action and result. And the point of this discussion was I don't think that I'm the sole doer or we are the non doers. But rather, we see that I have I have my part which I should do carefully. And in looking at my part, we consider if success is not coming, whether these three factors, one, two, three. That is my, is the work, what are three things we consider if success is not coming? Is the work incompatible? Then is the place inhospitable? This is not the place where these things work. And the last is, is my endeavor insufficient? So if we consider these factors, then we won't blame destiny for what thing not working out, but we can evaluate and learn and grow. Then we discussed about how in the translation of action, so there is jnana which comes in, then there is the karta, the karma that comes out, and in between there is there is buddhi, dhritti and sukha. So, the idea was that Krishna analyzes all of these in terms of three modes and helps us uh, understand how by being in sattva, one can avoid bandhana, bondage. Then he gives the hierarchy of how through karma yoga, through jnana yoga, to bhakti yoga. And he says there is an alternative way of that. So after that, Krishna gives the conclusion of the Gita. So the same theme of Bhakti, he emphasizes that I am going to give you the most confidential knowledge. 64 has multiple intensifiers. He is revealing that because his focus is on explaining that this is most important. He's reading that was Krishna said, I want to know what your Arjuna said, I want to know what your desire is. And 65 is Krishna is emphasizing, I will take responsibility. And Krishna, that is, we contrast 65 with 934. 66 is that I will protect. Like a doctor taking unlimited liability. And then we discussed how um, Krishna's extending himself. If you preach, if you can't preach, study, if you can't study. Then just here. And then lastly, uh, Arjuna says that uh, he asks Krishna that have you heard and understood? And Krishna says, Yes. So I will do I will do your will. This is the universal conclusion that we all can arrive at. That means Krishna. You have some will, you have some plan for me, and I am ready to do what is your plan for me. And after that last part, we discuss Sanjay he is demonstrating Karma Yoga as well as Bhakti Yoga. That Bhakti Yoga means that there can be happiness without success. So sometimes we may get both, sometimes we may not get both. But ultimately, we will get success. Uh, we will be happy because of our connection with Krishna. And 1.1, its answer comes indirectly in 1878. The focus of the Gita is to glorify Krishna. No, it is to transform, to clarify for Arjuna and transform his disposition, his decision. So Arjuna's Gandiva, you know, it represents our determination in life. Sometimes life is so tough and complicated and discouraging. But we just put aside our pose saying, I can't fight, like, I give up. But if we hear the Gita's message, we understand Krishna's enduring love for us, then what will happen is, uh, just as Arjuna picked up his bow, we too 
will pick up our bows and we'll also become enthusiastic to face whatever battles life sends our way. Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki jaya. Srila Prabhupad ki jaya. Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki jaya. Gaur Premanande. Jaya. So thank you very much to all of you for participating in this Gita Yajna. We did it for 18 days probably. More than 36 hours, 40 hours nearly. So it is amazing to see your eagerness to learn, your enthusiasm, your thoughtfulness in asking questions. And I pray that Krishna's message stay alive and keep guiding you in your life. And I hope that that continues to happen to me also. Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai. Jai.